I'm going to start with a story, um, Stuart, because uh, it's a story that some of the listeners might know, but but it, you probably don't know in this level of detail. And it sets the stage for why this is a topic that is of great interest to me personally. Um, and of course, by extension, I, I suspect that there are very few people who are going to listen to us today who can't relate to the subject at hand. So uh, the very abridged version of the story is... Um, I, I grew up uh, doing all sorts of really aggressive things and really took to powerlifting when I was probably 14 um, and found myself reasonably strong for a little scrawny kid. And between about the ages of 14 and 19, I really, really pushed, uh, couldn't bench press to save my life, but seemed pretty strong in a squat and deadlift um, and kind of ignored any claims my parents made that maybe I was doing a little too much. Um, and, <laughs> and, um, I t truthfully and sadly had no formal instruction. There was no, you know, I was just watching the other grown men in the gym who were insanely powerful, um, and, and sort of just trying to replicate what they were doing, but, but truthfully had no sense of what I was doing. Anyway, fast forward. Um, I am 21 years old. I'm rowing at the time, so rowing crew, and for the first time in my life, I experienced lower back pain. And um, this really rocked my world because I always thought that people who got lower back pain were people who did nothing. I, it, I, I never really thought someone who was as active as, as I was could get it. And for about two weeks, Stuart, it completely D completely disabled me. Um, you know, I could sort of get around, but barely. Um, and being a college student, I didn't really have any resources. I didn't know what to do. I, I was able to get to, this was actually, I think it occurred during the summer. So I didn't have classes, but you know, I had to stop rowing. I remember that. And otherwise I was able to work. Um, it went away and I thought everything was fine and I never thought about it again until the summer three years later when I was 24 years old and I remember exactly where I was. I was in San Diego riding my bike up the steepest hill in San, Di San Diego, which is a certain patch of a mountain called Mount Soledad. And uh, there's a, a, a section of this thing where you make a sharp right turn and at that moment it's about a 25 degree pitch. And I experienced this very sudden pain in my lower back and like a typical idiot just kept on pushing and climbing to the top and finished my ride, but then went on to experience the exact same thing, Stuart. For two weeks, I was debilitated, couldn't do a thing other than sort of lay around and walk. But then it got better and I kind of just forgot all about it. And then fast forward to the big one. It's I'm now, doing pattern recognition here. Peter. Yeah, yeah. So the big, <laughs> the big one occurred in my third year of medical school. I'm now 27 years old. And the remarkable consistency of this is not lost on me. It is every three years by the summer, the summer of 94, 97, and 2000. And I'm riding my bike from class to the gym. And um, I get to the gym, hop off my bike to lock it up. And all of a sudden, I feel that same familiar, just horrible pain in my back. <clears throat> but this time, it's a little worse than the, the previous two bouts. And it was so bad that I did something I'd never done before, Stuart. I decided not to go into the gym. And so I just slowly got back on the bike and limped my way back to my apartment and wasn't able to do anything other than just sort of lay in bed. I assumed I'd be fine the next morning, and I woke up the next morning and actually couldn't get out of bed. Uh, luckily, my roommate and I each had separate phone lines, so I was able to call him <clears throat> from my room, <clears throat> and uh, so began the a really painful journey over the next couple of weeks where the only place I could find relief was bent at 90 degrees forward, where I would basically stand and bend over the nurse's station. By this point, I was doing my clinical rotations. And as every good gunning medical student knows, there was no way I was going to miss a day of this. So <clears throat> I would drag myself into the hospital each day and somehow managed to get through this. The nurses took pity on me and so did the residents and they were injecting me full of Tordal. And this went on for a month. And um, 
And it got so bad that eventually the pain progressed from just being debilitating in my lower back to a nerve pain that felt like my foot was being skinned. And it was interesting in that the pain in my lower back started to subside as it was replaced by the feeling of my left foot being skinned from the bottom. Um, uh, I'm not gonna go into the more details of the story because it gets worse and worse before getting better, but needless to say, um, I, I have a graduate degree in back pain. Um, there's a happy ending to this story, Stuart, which is after this particular, this bout, which occurred when I was 27, which took a year to resolve, um, I made it kind of a mission to figure out what was going on. And I'm not suggesting that I have, but I know so much more now than I did then. And fortunately, um, anytime I've had back pain since then, it has been a very, very short lived experience. Um, I'll plant one last seed before we jump into this, just for both you and the listener, so that we can come back to it. If you are to look at an MRI of my spine today, um, you would ask yourself, maybe not you because you're so well versed, but a reasonable person would look at an MRI of my spine today at the age of 50 and say, how does he walk? Like, how, it, this person must be in so much pain, he doesn't know his name. And yet I can tell you for the most part, I'm not at all. Occasionally I get a little tight in my, you know, my lower back musculature, but you know, I don't have radicular pain. I am not, I'm not limited in anything I do. Um, <clears throat> again, suggesting that the correlation between the image of my back on an MRI and my symptoms, uh, is pretty light. Okay. So with all that as a backdrop, um, the fact that you're smiling so much as I tell you this story, it tells me not that you're taking pleasure in my pain, but rather the familiarity of my story. Exactly. I've been doing pattern recognition. There's only one thing that would account for the repeated acute episodes. In the interim between each one, you were quite fine. Then it shifted to a ridiculous pain. And now you're at the stage of your life where it's more uh, an occasional grumpiness when you cross what we call the tipping point. So if you did the pain go to your foot, Peter? Yes. It, it, to toes, big toes or little toes? No, it was actually really interesting. It was, it was a, it was a burning pain that was like the bottom of the foot was being skinned. I should have, I, I, there's one detail I should have um, uh, shared with you that might explain this. When I finally did have surgery, um, it, it, it turned out I had a free fragment that was about five centimeters long from the L5 S1, um, disc. So that free fragment had broken off. Well, I was going to guess this for you, actually, that yeah. I was going to ask you which foot and did it, uh, so the fifth root goes to your big toe, but anyway, you carry on. Sorry. Yep. And so, so basically the really, really unbearable pain I was having presumably was because that free fragment was parked on the S1 nerve root. Um, and even though it ended up taking two surgeries to get that out, uh, and those surgeries ended up causing more damage that needed more repair that turned into a journey of, a, a thousand cuts. Um, you know, I was on the, I was on the, I was on the road to recovery, but, but the radicular pain seemed to be directly a result of the, um, uh, S1 nerve root. Mm -hmm.